Savior's Lutheran of Hastings, Minnesota. If you've been with us before, welcome back. And if this is your first time joining us for our online worship, we're so glad that you're with us. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Our Lord Jesus, bless us with your presence and in our worship. Bless us with your word that we read and preach and listen to, and bless us in our faith. Amen. We believe confession and forgiveness is important for us in our lives, um, corporately as a congregation, and even more specifically as individuals, that we can acknowledge the ways that we have failed in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, either by doing or not doing things, and then bring them to the Lord for forgiveness. So we're now going to share in confession and forgiveness. Um, I will be speaking both the parts uh, of the pastor as well as uh, for the congregation. Please join me. O oh, merciful God, help your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Send us your Holy Spirit that we may fully admit our sin, receive your forgiveness, and so live in the gift of life that Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, gives us. O oh God, we admit that we are bound by sin and by ourselves cannot break free. We have failed sinning against you in thought, word, and action, both in what we have done and by what we have not done. We have not loved you, O Lord, and we have not loved our neighbors nor ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. 
Forgive us so that we may be renewed and so led forward again in your will and ways. Amen. God, in his mercy, has given his Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And for his sake, then, God forgives us all of our sins. In Jesus' name, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't know anyone who likes conflict. And yet, all too often, conflict's a part of life. In today's reading, Jesus talks about conflict. So what do you think? As you listen to this, is he spelling out rules of engagement or talking about how to build an authentic Christian community? Is he giving us a code of conduct? Or is he describing how we regain people who are at odds? Is his purpose setting out a way to settle disputes? Or describing how living with a sense of Jesus' presence creates a catalyst for bringing forgiveness, healing, and peace? Well, listen, and you decide. The reading is from Matthew 
chapter 18. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Well, dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Mom, he hit me. That's because you took my train. Well, you aren't playing with it. It's mine. I want it. As a parent or grandparent, have you ever heard a conversation like that? It's not unusual for conflict to occur among siblings growing up together. Of course, conflict isn't just something that happens among children. Growing older doesn't make conflict any less likely. What we find ourselves in conflict about simply changes. And conflict is a part of life. Unfortunately, many of us have had experiences where conflict has been destructive. Conflict has caused you or someone else to be hurt. Relationships were broken. Grudges are held. And bitterness, animosity, and resentment linger. As a result, many people see conflict as only something negative. But conflict doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes it can be positive. It can lead to growth. Didn't you as a parent or grandparent as you were working with your children try to have them learn how to work out their differences and learn to live and play together better? And that learning would not be possible without conflict happening in the first place. There's far more that can be said about conflict than there's time to address in a sermon. Entire books and seminars have been devoted to helping people respond to it in more helpful ways. And this passage itself, leads itself lends itself better to a Bible study or a discussion than to a sermon. But here we are. In addition, as important as dealing with conflict in constructive ways is, I believe Jesus is up to something more here than giving us a brief life lesson on how to deal with conflict. It's helpful to understand that this portion of scripture is located within a larger context. Before this, Jesus has told the parable about the lost sheep, where the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes looking for the one who is lost until he finds it. And after that, just after this scripture, Peter asked Jesus how many times he should forgive someone who sins against him. Seven times? And Jesus says, 70 times seven. Today's reading is within a larger context of Jesus talking about what it means to be living together as a Christian community. Jesus' emphasis is on regaining someone who is done something to hurt you or the community. And Jesus assumes conflict will happen. He assumes the church is not and will not be a perfect place. The fact that we're trying to live by God's grace, be people who forgive, and have the promise of Jesus' presence with us does not mean that conflict cannot or will not happen. Nor does it mean that all conflicts can be resolved without the need for boundaries to be set on some behaviors. And, unfortunately, that some people 
may choose to not want to conform to those boundaries. Extreme examples can help illustrate the point. None of us would want someone to actively be engaged in abusing children in the church. We want our children to be safe and protected, and we have a responsibility to see that they are. Seeking to regain someone does not mean capitulating to behavior that is inappropriate or harmful. But it also doesn't mean that we should be rigidly judgmental or condemning. Remaining connected and honestly speaking the truth in love is very difficult to do. And it's tempting to either minimize or pretend conflict doesn't exist or to cut off the relationship. Jesus says that if people refuse to hear even the church, that that person should be like a Gentile or a tax collector. But it's good to remember and ask, well, how did Jesus deal with Gentiles and tax collectors? How did he treat the tax collector Zacchaeus or Matthew? How did he respond to the Roman centurion servant or the Gerizim demoniac or the Samaritan woman at the well or the Syrophoenician woman and her sick daughter? If you recall, Jesus responded with healing, care, love, hope, and compassion. Jesus doesn't simply write off or get rid of people who are not yet in line with everything that he's about. He responds to their needs and tries to bring them along. In the midst of conflict, it can be easy to scapegoat the people that we're in conflict with. In his 1987 book, The People of the Lie, The Hope for Healing Human Evil, M. Scott Peck wrote, it is not their sins per se that characterize evil people. Rather, it is the subtlety and persistence and consistency of their sins. This is because the central deficit and defect of evil is not the sin, but the refusal to acknowledge it. Evil then, is most often committed in order to scapegoat. In the people I label as evil are chronic scapegoaters. In other words, the evil attacked others instead of facing their own failures. Spiritual regrowth requires acknowledgement of one's need to grow. If we cannot make that acknowledgement, we have no option except to attempt to eradicate the evidence of our imperfection. By ultimately including the whole community in the process of dealing with conflict, Jesus sets up guardrails to help address the tendency to scapegoat each other. It is in this sense that of Jesus' presence in the community that separates this from a seminar on conflict resolution. Jesus places his brief summary for dealing with conflict within the framework of his presence within the Christian community. A story from R. William Wright's Stories for the Journey illustrates this well. He writes, there was a famous monastery which had fallen on very hard times. Formerly, its many buildings were filled with young monks, and its big church resounded with singing of the chant. But now, it was deserted. People no longer came to be nourished there by prayer. A handful of old monks shuffled through the cloisters and praised their God with heavy hearts. On the edge of the monastery woods, an old rabbi had built a little hut. And he would come there from time to time to fast and pray. No one ever spoke with him. But whenever he appeared, the word would be passed from monk to monk. The rabbi walks in the woods. And for as long as he was there, the monks would feel sustained by his prayerful, prayerful presence. Well, one day the abbot decided to visit the rabbi and open his heart to him. 
So after morning Eucharist, he set out through the woods. And as he approached the hut, the rabbi saw that the rabbi was standing in the doorway, his arms outstretched in welcome. It was though he had been waiting there for some time. Well, the two embraced like long lost brothers. Then they stepped back and just stood there, smiling at one another with smiles their faces could hardly contain. After a while, the rabbi motioned for the rab abbot to enter. In the midst of the room was a wooden table with the scriptures open on it. They sat there for a moment in the presence of the book. Then the rabbi began to cry, and the abbot could not contain himself. He covered his face with his hands and began to cry too. And for the first time in his life, he cried his heart out. The two men sat there like lost children, filling the hut with their sobs and wetting the wood of the table with their tears. And after the tears had ceased to flow, there was quiet again. And the rabbi lifted his head. You and your brothers are serving God with heavy hearts, he said. You have come to ask a teaching of me. I will give you a teaching, but you can only repeat it once. After that, no one must ever say it aloud again. The rabbi looked straight at the abbot and said, the Messiah is among you. For a while, all was silent. Then the rabbi said, now you must go. And the abbot left without a word and without ever looking back. The next morning, the abbot called his monks together in the chapel room, and he told them that he'd received a teaching from the rabbi who walks in the woods, and that his teaching was never to be spoken aloud. Then he looked at each of his brothers and said, the rabbi said that one of us is the Messiah. The monks were startled by his saying. What could it mean, they asked himself. Is Brother John the Messiah? Or is Father Matthew? Or Brother Thomas? Am I the Messiah? What could this mean? They were all deeply puzzled by the rabbi's teaching, but no one ever mentioned it again. As time went on, the monks began to treat one another with a very special reverence. There was a gentle, wholehearted, human quality about them now, which was hard to describe, but easy to notice. They lived with one another as men who had finally found something, but they prayed the scriptures together as men who were always looking for something. Occasionally, visitors found themselves deeply moved by the life of these monks, and before long, people were coming from far and wide to be nourished by the prayer life of the monks, and young men were asking once again to become part of the community. In those days, the rabbi no longer walked in the woods. His hut had fallen into ruins. But now, somehow or other, the old monks who had taken his teaching to heart still felt sustained by his prayerful presence. Jesus promises to be present when we gather in his name. May you also be sustained by his promise. Amen. My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. I hear the sweet though far of him that hails a new Give it.
How can I keep from singing? How can I keep from singing? How can I keep from singing? How can I keep? Let us confess our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the Church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Gracious God, help us to live authentically as your people, called into community by Jesus, your Son, who sustains us as brothers and sisters in him. And so help us to see Jesus and his love when we see each other, even in and especially during times of conflict. Lead us, Lord, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Master of the universe, we pray today for your creation, both humanity as well as all living things and the earth upon which we stand. As we suffer from the increased devastation from drought and floods, tornadoes and hurricanes, fires and earthquakes, heat and cold, lead us and inspire us to the creativity and purpose needed to rein in our excesses and human-caused damage to limit the changes that are creating changes in our climate and in your creation. Lead us, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, you who are the peace of the world, we ask for your advent into the war zones of the world. Change the hearts and minds of the leaders that have brought about the wars and violence in Ukraine, Sudan, Niger, and all other hot spots around the world. Bring peace to the neighborhoods and individual lives filled with hate here in America. Help us to look at our fellow citizens as well as immigrants and visitors with the eyes and minds of our Savior that we may try and love rather than hate. And ask, Lord, that you be with our political leaders, either those who have been elected or appointed, that they may lead for the good of all and not for their own purposes or the purposes of those who support them. Lead us, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, if healing to you, we give all whom are ill, injured, living with a condition or fighting a disease, those who are lonely or in despair. We ask for healing in the body, mind, or spirit of all for whom we pray. We ask that you give healing to Russ, Richard, and Jerry, and all whom we hold in our hearts who need your presence. Bring comfort and peace to those who are grieving. We ask for your presence with the family and friends of Scott Pigalki. We pray that you surround them with your love. Give all who grieve solace in their sorrow and hold them in comfort and give them your peace. Lead us, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And then, Lord, we ask that you bless all who have returned to school, be it preschool, high school, college, or graduate school, or everything in between. We pray that you not only be with the students, but all those who work in our schools, teachers, administrators, coaches, staff, support staff, and be with all parents. We pray for a school year where people learn, where the kids are able to learn and grow, and teachers are able to teach. Be with all of us as we work, and if we're in the wrong vocation, lead us to the right vocation where we may use our gifts and our talents and our passions for you and your people. 
Lead us, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious guide, we give all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy and love. Amen. I invite you to pray with me the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As with all churches and congregations here in America, we operate, we go about doing Jesus' ministry here in this place through the offerings that we receive, that we give um, as a community. And so we want to give you thanks for all of the offerings that you give us of money and finances, bonds, stocks, all that, as well as the gifts that you give of yourself, your energy, your time, your talents, your passions, all that make God's ministry here in this place, as well as around the world, happen. So let us give thanks in prayer. We thank you, dear Jesus, for all that you give us in our lives. Help us to offer back to you and your work here on earth a portion of what we have received. Bless our th offerings for your people and ministry. Amen. And I want to thank you for your part in God's ministry here at Our Saviors. Now for a few announcements. Uh, first of all, for those of you who are members or who attend with us and are, and are on our mailing list, you will be receiving an email soon that uh, will have a survey attached. Now this survey is only two questions um, that we want you to write out an answer to. It's not multiple choice. And the survey builds off of what we learned last winter during our roundtable discussions. Um, so it's only two questions. We ask that you take the time to fill it out um, because the answers to these two questions will help guide us in our future ministry. If uh, you don't receive the email or don't have the chance to be here in service and pick it up, you can stop by the office or give a call to the office and we can mail one to you as well, a paper copy. Greetings, members of our Savior's Lutheran Church. Many of you remember what an amazing time we had last year at our women's Advent dinner and our women's spring luncheon that was a fundraiser for our youth. Our donations made it possible to have many more of our youth to be able to attend mission trips and Bible camps. And I can't thank you enough. Well, we're going to have another Advent dinner for the women on Sunday, December 3rd, but stay tuned for details. I'm here to talk about something else. We have decided we need to honor the men and boys of our congregation, and so we are going to host a dinner for just the men of all ages at our Savior's Lutheran here on Sunday, October 1st at 5 p.m. Chef Johnny will be preparing a wonderful meal of pork loin and Swedish meatballs, and of course, all the trimmings. The youth of our church will be serving the dinner and cleaning up. We will be honoring the late Pastor Bill Strom and his enormous contribution to our music program and Lee Nelson, who was a huge proponent of getting our youth involved. And he was also a very gen generous contributor to the cause. Gordy Gathright will be entertaining us with song and I will be giving a humorous talk. So men of our Savior's Lutheran, bring your sons, bring your grandsons, and pick up your men friends who have trouble getting around and come join us on October 1st, Sunday at five o'clock. The suggested price for the banquet is $25. However, if you can't afford it, come anyway. We know God always provides. We will have signups in the church between services, or call the church with your reservation. Men, let's all join in. Let's make this happen. Let's help our youth. We had 140 women who came to our Advent dinner last 
winter, let's see if you can beat it. You know, the youth are our future of this church. God bless you all. Thank you. Now I invite you to receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thank you for joining us today, and we invite you back next week and every week. God bless you. Bye-bye. God of justice, Savior to all, came to rescue the weak and the poor, chose to serve and have called us freely we've received now freely we will give we must go live to feed the hungry stand beside the broken we must go stepping forward keep us from just seeing move us into action Go. To act justly every day, loving mercy in every way, walking humbly before.